أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. My respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After a rather long break, we welcome you back to our Sunday morning program. Inshallah, you did not go through much difficulty with the last COVID wave. I know many people contracted the virus, but inshallah it was on the weaker side and Allah protected you. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to protect you all and your families. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, which is chapter five of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands believers to maintain purity before they pray. So in verse six, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, Ida qumtum ila salah, when you are preparing to pray, you're about to pray, you want to pray your daily prayers, you have to maintain this very important condition, which is the condition of purity. Wash your face and wash your two arms to the elbow, meaning from the elbow to the fingers, that's the area that you have to wash. And also wipe on your head and on your two feet to the ankle. This beautiful verse commands the believers to maintain their physical and spiritual purity for salah. My dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of the religion of Islam is that when you analyze these rituals at a deeper level, you come to be inspired, you will be in awe at the symbolism behind these acts, the deeper meanings and secrets behind these daily activities that we engage in. I guarantee you 99% of Muslims when they do the wudu, they don't realize what the significance of the wudu is. It's just a daily routine where you, you wash your face and hands and that's it. We do not look beyond that. We do not analyze the secrets of this beautiful act of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us. Wudu is an act of worship. That's why it requires niyyah. You're dedicating it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you countless blessings when you offer the wudu, knowing its dimensions, knowing its secrets, knowing the symbolism behind every act. So in our discussion this morning, I would like to walk you through some of the secrets of wudu. Once you analyze these secrets, my dear brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, wudu will change your life. The way you will carry yourself that day, the way you will see these beautiful acts of worship, it will change your life. It will make you a better person. It will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what is the origin of the wudu? Because we know that Islamic rituals usually have a story behind them. One day, according to the book Al al sharaiq by al-Shaykh al-Saduq, he narrates an interesting hadith. He says, one day a group of Jews came to the Prophet and they told him, Oh Muhammad, tell us about wudu. 
Why is it that in Islam you wash these four body parts or limbs? The face and the hands, you wash them. And then the head and the feet, you wipe them. Why these four body parts? Is there a significance to that? The Prophet ﷺ responds to them by saying, yes. I will tell you where the wudu starts from. And he takes them back thousands of years to the creation of Prophet Adam And the Prophet ﷺ states that when Adam approached the tree, now we in the school of Ahlul Bayt don't believe that Adam sinned. It was not a sin that earns the wrath of God or punishment. But he did not take the advice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah told him, don't approach that tree. Shaytan came and he took a false oath in God's name. He told him, I swear in the name of Allah, go and approach that tree. There are benefits for you. It will prolong your life here. You'll stay in this garden forever. Now Adam, because he's so pure and innocent, he didn't think that any creation could make a false oath in God. That never crossed his mind. That's how he fell for Satan. So it wasn't a sin. God wanted Adam to come to earth anyway. Allah told him, you can stay in this beautiful garden for as long as you want. But if you approach that tree, your trial starts. Difficulty starts. Allah wanted him to stay longer, but he forgot about the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet says, when Adam approached that tree, he first looked at the forbidden tree. When he looked at the forbidden tree, it's as if this light was taken away from his face. Because when you look at something that's forbidden, that generates negative energy towards your face. And that is the reason why Allah wants us to wash the face. To remind us that when there is negative energy around you, when you look at something that's forbidden, something that's inappropriate, that face needs to be purified. And then the hadith states, he walked towards that tree. And that is why you have to wipe on your feet. Because it was the first time that a human being walked towards something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has discouraged from. And then was, with his hands, he tried to approach the tree, to take the fruits of that tree with his hands. That's why we wash our hands, to purify them. And then when he realized what, what happened and that Satan deceived him, he put his hands on his head and he started to cry. And that's what the masih, what the wiping on the head represents. The wudu, my dear brothers and sisters, contains this in interesting history behind it. Where the experience of Prophet Adam السلام, is a learning moment for us. It's a teaching moment. Be careful. These are the main body parts that you use to commit actions and to sin and to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why every day, at least three or five times, you maintain that purity to remind yourself, these are the body parts that I normally use to sin. The face, most of the sins that we commit, they emanate from the face. Our eyes, the looks, the inappropriate looks, when you look at something immoral, that's a sin. When you look at your parents with hatred, the hadith states that brings the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many, many sins you can commit with the eye. You can mock someone with your eye. You can make fun of someone with your eye. And then the tongue, the words that we use, most of the sins that we commit, is to the face. That's why in wudu, you begin by washing the face. And then with our hands, we commit many sins. We wash our hands in wudu to remind us, keep these hands for Allah. 
keep them in God's obedience. Use them to do that which is good. Use them to establish justice, to help others, to do something noble in your life. Now what does wiping on the head represent? According to one hadith, it represents your wiping your intellect and purifying it. Purifying it from what? From doubts, evil thoughts, suspicions about other people, planning to hurt other people, to bring them down. All these negative thoughts that we have in our mind, the wudu symbolically is teaching you purify your mind, your intellect from anything that's negative, anything that's evil, anything that's not productive. Look at the symbolism behind the wudu, my dear brothers and sisters. And then when you wipe on your feet, you're reminding yourself, the places that I go to, are they in Allah's obedience or no? I am using my two feet, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with. Is it in His path? Is it in His obedience or no? That's the beautiful symbolism behind wudu, my dear, my dear brothers and sisters. Every time you do the wudu, remember this. Oh Allah, I am washing my face. I'm purifying it. Allow me this day to use my face in your obedience. And then the beauty of wudu, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we have to do wudu with pure, clean water. Water that has positive energy. Water that's not clean does not have positive energy. Water that's stolen or you got it from haram money, that does not have positive energy. That's why one of the requirements and conditions of wudu is for the water to be pure, not najis, to be lawful for you, not stolen. Or if you buy that money or you pay bills with haram money, your water bill, that creates negative energy. When you look at water, it's teaching you how to be like water. That's why Allah wants us to purify ourselves with water. Notice a few beautiful attributes about water. Number one, it's pure. When it's pure, it's clear you can see right through it. That's how your heart should be as a mu'min. Learn from the water that you do wudu from to be innocent, to be pure. Water, in fact, when it's so clear, it acts like a mirror. It reflects everything, right? That's how a believer should be. So pure like that water to reflect everything. Not like muddy water where you cannot see past through it. Sometimes our hearts become murky and muddy. Through wudu, we are training ourselves to be pure like this water. So when you look at the water, my dear brothers and sisters, and you're about to do your wudu, just for a few seconds, think about that. Ya Allah, you've created this water. It's so pure. It purifies everything. It's so clear. It's a reflection of reality, just like a mirror. Make me like that, O oh Allah. Make me pure like this water. Allow me to reflect the true reality through this water. Allow me to be honest, just like the water is honest and it reflects your appearance. Look at all this beautiful symbolism behind the act of wudu. My dear brothers and sisters, if you do this three, four, five times a day, believe me, that day will be a different day. If you just remember these symbolic acts, it brings you closer to Allah. It gives you that feeling of serenity. It gives you that feeling of calmness, that feeling of peace. You truly purify yourself. Wudu is not just physically washing yourself. It's a spiritual exercise that brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, it's highly recommended, even if you're on wudu, to do an extra mustahab wudu. In fact, Islamically, before any activity, it's mustahab to do wudu. One hadith from the Imam alayhi salam states, إِنَّ الْوُضُوءَ عَلَى الْوُضُوءَ نُورٌ عَلَى نُورٌ when you do wudu upon wudu, that's light upon light. You're about to leave the house, it's mustahab do wudu. You're about to do an activity, it's mustahab do wudu. You're about to have a meal. You are already on wudu, let's say. Do wudu. 
One hadith states from the Imam السلام, that before having a meal, if you do wudu, Allah will bring down a special barakah to your house. Because you're constantly training yourself to have that purity. Before you sleep, do wudu. The hadith from the Prophet ﷺ states, the one who does wudu before he sleeps, before she sleeps, their bed turns into a masjid. Their bed turns into a masjid. And Allah will consider them to be worshipping Him all night long. You're sleeping. You're not doing anything. But Allah will consider you to be worshipping Him. Because that is the blessings that wudu gives you while you're sleeping. And then the Prophet ﷺ states, and if that person dies, let's say their time has come and they're supposed to die, they die as a shaheed. If you do die in the state of wudu, you die as a shaheed, according to the Prophet ﷺ. You die like a martyr who is completely forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet says, I know this is a little bit concerning, but the Prophet says, if you sleep without wudu, your bed becomes like a grave and you become a corpse till the morning. Because you know sleeping is a type of death. Allah states in the Holy Quran, Allah says He's the one who takes your souls when you die and also when you sleep. That's why sleep is considered minor death. Because there is one dimension of the soul that leaves the body. And that's how you see dreams from an Islamic perspective. It's the visions that your soul sees. The hadith states, if the angels, if you make it to the realm of the angels and they depict to you the images, that's a true dream. And if your soul wanders to the realm of the shayateen, they give you false images. And that's why you see false dreams. That is the soul seeing all of that. It is a minor death according to the Holy Quran. So the Prophet says, do you want to make your bed a masjid? Or do you want to make it a grave? That's your choice. The way to do that is just to have wudu. And by having wudu, my dear brothers and sisters, right before you sleep, you do wudu. You recite a beautiful verse from the Holy Quran. That night you will have a peaceful sleep. Guaranteed, try it. I know people who come up to me, say it, I have nightmares. I cannot get rid of these nightmares. I've seen therapists, I, nothing works. I see myself screaming sometimes, sweating profusely. I can't sleep well. So there are a few recommendations and by the way, there are specific du'as for that that are really effective, extremely effective. But one thing that's really effective is to do wudu and sleep. Almost guaranteed, it will get rid of those nightmares and reduce their frequency. So the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to always be in the state of wudu. Even if you have wudu, do another wudu, you're about to leave the house. The Prophet says, if you die, you'll die as a shaheed in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is truly a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So pay attention, my dear brothers and sisters, to the symbolism behind these beautiful rituals. These rituals are aimed at purifying us physically but also spiritually. It just will make you a spiritual person. Now is there science behind wudu? Has modern science uncovered any special aspects of wudu? Absolutely. You will find many scientific articles that speak about the amazing blessings of wudu. The physical effects, the health effects of wudu. Number one, Wudu refreshes your body. That's why you'll even see yoga experts. They tell you that before you sleep, wash certain body parts. Wash the face, wash the hands. This is part of some meditative exercises. Many yoga experts, they command their followers to do that. In Islam, you don't need yoga. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something much better than that. Something that He has given for you. Something that has been proven. Something that thousands of prophets have tried and they can confirm to you. It relaxes your body. This has been proven scientifically. So that's one benefit. The second benefit, it activates 
the blood circulation in your body. Because when you do wudu, you gently apply pressure to the body parts, the face, the arms, that actually encourages better flow of blood in your body. It improves the circulation of blood. That in itself reduces the stress hormones in your body. It gives you a sense of tranquility. And it's healthy. It's healthy for your heart. It's healthy for your joints. It's healthy for your body parts. This is another beautiful, amazing effect that we get from wudu. The third benefit, who here is familiar with something called reflexology? Have you heard of that? So basically, this is you know, primarily found in some Asian types of medicine, like Chinese old medicine. The basic idea is that the entire body is very interconnected. And you have all these nerves in the body that are connected. So if you apply pressure or gently massage certain body parts, you can heal other body parts. That's the basic premise and idea behind it. Wudu gives you this same exact benefit. You're massaging your arm, but you're offering healing to other types of the, to other body parts in your body. And that is a beautiful, amazing health benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us when we are engaging in the beautiful practice of wudu. By the way, one thing that when I was growing up, we heard it's mustahab in our hadith. I always wondered about it. Why? And then recently, you know, when, when I saw some articles about how the body works, how the nerves work, I came to find some of the wisdom behind it. When a man is doing a wudu, when a male is doing a wudu, it's mustahab to pour water on which side of your arm? Does anyone know? You have the outer part of the arm, right? Which is like facing you if you're holding your hand like that. And then you have the inner part. Just like how you have the outer palm and the inner palm. When it comes to the wudu of a man, it's mustahab to start pouring water on which side? On the outer arm. But for the sisters, for the females, it's mustahab to pour water on which side? The inner part. What's the significance behind that? Any guesses? Any educated guesses? There is a biological basis for that and also an interesting social basis for that. As for the biological basis, you will find many scientific articles telling us about the, you know, main nerves that we have in our arms. There's like three main nerves in our arms. Some of them are closer to the inner part of the arm, some of them are on the other side. They have conducted a lot of studies to see the differences between males and females when it comes to these nerves. And they have found significant differences. Males are sensitive, more sensitive to nerves, you know, to certain nerves than females are. And then when you take that data and you match it to hadiths like that, you find that subhanAllah it corresponds. When it comes to females, there are certain nerves on the inner side of the arm where if they are massaged or washed, that has a greater effect for the females. And for the males on the other side of the arm, that would be better for them to massage it. And 14 centuries ago, you find the religion of Islam beautifully giving us these recommendations. By the way, this is only mustahab. Don't freak out, say that's not how I've been doing wudu, I have to repeat my prayers. That is only recommended. It is not wajib. It's recommended to start your wudu like that for males and the inner side for females. Now this is the biological basis. This also has a beautiful social aspect. The social aspect has to do with the role of a man and a woman, the father and a mother. When you put, pour water on the inner side of the arm, that could symbolize that the role of a mother is very important, definitely. In fact, the most important nerves are on the inner side. However, it's more of an inherent role. And that beautifully corresponds to the concept of hijab. 
the concept of hijab, the concept of modesty applies to both men and women. But it's more applicable to sisters, more applicable to females. That there is more emphasis on the inner side, not the outside appearance. Even the acts of wudu help you with that. To consider that inner side. And that's the beauty of a female. The beauty, the true beauty of a female is the inner aspect of her existence. And the hijab helps us realize that. Don't focus on the outside appearance. Be more focused with the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the character of a female, to the special intelligence of a female, to, the, uh, to her amazing capacity to multitask. Biologically, men and women are differently. They're very different biologically. And, and that helps explain many Islamic laws, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, just to give you an example, women on average, they have four times the number of neurons connecting the right side of the brain to the left side, more than men. On average, those neurons that connect these two sides, women have four times the number of neurons that men have. And that is why they are able to multitask, right? Have you seen, you know, the typical image? Like your mother in the kitchen, she's cooking, she has the phone, she's speaking, and she's running the house all at once. And she's fully aware of what's happening. And you know, sometimes we men, we look at that we're like, wow, how do you do that? You know, sometimes I need to just focus on one task. Men, generally speaking, are not good multitaskers. But women are. Why? Because Allah has given them a brain that gives them that capacity. But that's beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given females that capacity because of their special role. One of them is motherhood. Motherhood, that beautiful sacred role which today unfortunately our western society has undermined. Has undermined. They don't, they don't care about that. One, one of my friends recent, recently, he shared with me this interesting um, incident that happened with an embassy here. He says, I called an embassy to renew our passports. They originally came from a Muslim country overseas. He says, I called the embassy to renew the passport. So they, I sent the application, so they called me back. He says, a lady called me back to just get some information so we can complete the application. So this, this friend says that the lady on the other side, she was a committed Muslim. She was an observant Muslim. She asked me, what's the profession of your mother? Because he also wanted his mother's passport to be renewed. So his mother, you know, doesn't have like an official job, right? She doesn't work outside the house. So he, he told her she's a housewife or she's a homemaker, as they say. He said, that lady got offended and she gave me a lecture. She told me, listen, don't say your mother is a homemaker. Don't say she's a housewife. Your mother has a full-time job, which is more important than every other job out there. I'm not going to write that on the application. So he said, I said to her, so what do you want to write? She said, I'm going to write occupation, mother. That is the best, most honorable occupation. Don't say housewife or homemaker. She's a mother. That's a full-time, beautiful job. And respect that job. <laughs> it's like, I called to get my passports, but I got a good lecture from the lady. A good lesson from her. That is true. That is true, my dear brothers and sisters. Our modern society, unfortunately, underestimates that. The religion of Islam has so much respect for this title, for this position, such that heaven lies beneath the feet of the mothers. That's the respect that Islam gives to the role of motherhood. And so even in the acts of wudu, you see these beautiful symbols. You see these beautiful messages being communicated to us. So my dear brothers and sisters, I wanted to share that with you. The secrets of wudu. Next time you do wudu, don't do a 30 second quick wudu and you don't even know what you're doing. Stop, think, reflect and realize the great blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you to the wudu. I would like to conclude with a beautiful hadith from the commander of the faithful. 
أمير المؤمنين صلوات الله عليه In this hadith His son Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya He had a son by the name of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya He was the half-brother of Imam Hassan and Hussein Peace be upon them Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya says One day I saw my father about to do wudu And he describes to us the wudu of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam he says, I saw my father. He took the water in his right arm. Then he poured in his right hand. Then he poured it in his left hand. That's mustahab to do. You know, when you start the wudu, how do you start the wudu? You take water in your right palm and you wash your face, right? That's how the wudu starts. But before the wudu, there are mustahab acts. To, let's say if there's a body part that's najis, you want to purify it, you would purify it with the left hand. So he says, I saw my father, he took water in his right palm, he poured it in his left palm, and then, you know, he purified anything that he needed to purify. And then he says, I saw my father, he took the water and he rinsed his mouth with it. That's not wajib in wudu, that is mustahab. What does this signify? He says, I heard Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam make this dua. As he was rinsing his mouth with the water, he says, Allahumma laqinni hujjati yawma alqaak. Oh Allah, on the day that I meet you, inspire my mouth to speak, to speak the truth, to answer the right questions. So when you do that in wudu, this is what you're reminding yourself of. That when I die, oh Allah, I'm asking you now to inspire me to speak when the angels interrogate me. Allow me to say the right answers. This is what it signifies. Oh Allah, just now as I'm rinsing my mouth, allow my tongue to always be thankful to you, to always remember you. This is the dua that the Imam made. And then when the Imam السلام, took the water, to purify the nose. That's mustahab by the way. It's called istinshaq where you sniff the water, right? That has health benefits. It removes a lot of bacteria and germs. It's not wajib. It's mustahab that you do it before wudu. The imam then made the following dua. Allahumma la tuharram alayya reeh al-jannah. Oh Allah, don't prohibit me from smelling the amazing aroma of paradise. وَاجْعَلْنِي مِمَّنْ يَشُمُّ رِيحَهَا وَرَوْحَهَا وَطِيبَهَا Allow me to smell the fragrance of paradise, the breeze of paradise, the goodness of paradise. That's what you remind yourself to say as you're doing this mustahab part of wudu. Then the Imam السلام, begins the wudu. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya says when he washed his face, the Imam السلام, made this dua, Allahumma bayyid wajhi yawma taswaddu feehi al-wujuh. Oh Allah, illuminate, brighten my face on that day when some faces are going to be dark because they failed their test. Look at the beautiful dua of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And then when he washed his right arm, he says, Oh Allah, on the day of judgment, give me my book in my right hand. And then when he washed his left arm, he says, Oh Allah, on the day of judgment, do not give me my book in my left hand. Do not make me amongst those who failed their test. Then he says, when he wiped his head, he says, Oh Allah, bring down your rahma on me, on my head, on my existence. Shower me with your blessing. And then when he wiped his two feet, he made the following dua. اللهم ثبتني على الصراط يوم تزل فيه الأقدام. Oh Allah, make me fix, fixed on the bridge of Sirat. That bridge which crosses over the fire of hell. Oh Allah, fix me on the Sirat on that day when many feet, when many feet will slip. I want you to fix my feet and make sure, Ya Allah, that in this life wherever I go to, it will be in your obedience. My dear brothers and sisters, listen to this part. You want the rahmah of Allah till the day of judgment? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib said to his son, My dear son, 
if any believer or any Muslim does the wudu that I did and makes the dua that I did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create from every drop of water. When you do wudu, how many drops of water do you use? Thousands? From every drop of water, Allah will create an angel who will pray for you and do good deeds on your behalf until the day of judgment. Can you imagine that? Imagine the rahmah of Allah. And sometimes we wonder, we ask, where is God's mercy? Allah's mercy is everywhere. But how unfortunate, how sad it is that most Muslims live an entire lifetime not knowing this. Not even caring about this. We know what's happening on TikTok, on social media. We're on top of all of that. Petty things, useless things that distract us, that take us away from our Lord. And this beautiful type of spiritual purity, all this amazing thawab and reward, we're completely oblivious to that. So I wanted to share with you, my dear brothers and sisters, some of the secrets of wudu because this is a daily activity that we all do. Let us be more familiar with it. Let us appreciate it. Believe me, when you inspect and analyze these beautiful rituals, you get excited to do them. It's no longer a burden. I know sometimes when you get up in the morning for the Fajr prayer, oh, that annoying wudu now that's going to affect my sleep. You know, when you're in a deep sleep, you're not that comfortable going, especially if the water is initially cold. You don't want to do that wudu. But now when you see beyond this physical act of just washing yourself, when you look at the barakah, when you look at the rahmah, you will be excited. You will be honored. You will be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving you the opportunity to purify yourself. That's just wudu. And this was the tip of the iceberg, believe me. We have so many more hadiths. I could... Stand here all day telling you about wudu based on the beautiful hadiths of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And then when you examine salah, oh salah and its secrets, you will be excited and you will feel honored to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Appreciate the religion that you have, my dear brothers and sisters. It's the most beautiful religion that Allah has given to humankind. Research it, understand it, share it with your friends. Be inspired and be honored that you are on this path and say, Oh Allah, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for guiding me. Billions of people out there are lost. They don't know where they're heading, what they're doing. At least you've given me that vision to see my destination. So with that, my dear brothers and sisters, we have a few minutes for any questions that you have. Do you have any questions about wudu, purity, or anything that's, that's related? Inshallah, we can begin the Q&A session with a loud salawat. No questions, reflections, comments? Yes, brother. Are there any uh, recommended words you can give others to learn? Okay, so the words of Imam Ali alayhi salam are the recommended words that you say. So when you are, fa for instance, washing your face, say the following. Allahumma bayyid wajhi yawma taswaddu feehi al-wujuh. Oh Allah, illuminate my face on the day of judgment when some faces will go dark. It's mustahab to say that. If you cannot memorize the Arabic, just say it in English. That's fine. And then when you're washing the right arm, basically say, Oh Allah, grant me my book of deeds on the day of judgment in my right arm. Because the Quran says those who pass their test, how will they receive their book in their right arm? So if you just say the dua of Imam Ali alayhi salam briefly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for that. Yes, sister. Can you do wudu in the shower? Okay. So one of the conditions for wudu is that you have two types of body parts for wudu. The first is the face and the arms. They don't have to be dry when you're doing wudu. So let's say your face is wet and you want to start wudu. You can do that. Let's say your arm is wet. It's moist. You can do that. That's the first part. The second part of wudu is where you wipe, which is the head and the feet. The head and the feet have to be dry. So if you're in the shower and your head is wet, 
your feet are wet, you cannot do wudu. Basically, what you would have to do is dry them. Let's say you have a towel next to you. Dry your head, dry your feet, and then do wudu in the shower if you can observe the condition of keeping, let's say, your feet dry by the time you wipe them. So that's why it's advisable to do the wudu outside of the shower because it's difficult to maintain this condition in the shower. And remember, you need the niyyah. You need to make the intention, the niyyah, that I am doing this for the sake of Allah. I know someone said, you know, for 10 years he was praying and doing wudu and he never made the niyyah. He thought wudu was just like just pouring water on your body, just tahiring it, right? Just purifying it. He never made in his mind even the niyyah that this is an act of worship, that this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is ibadah. That was not a valid wudu. Because wudu is not just washing your body. It's more than that. It's all that we have described. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Yes, Hajjah. Okay, so you would wipe your face before wiping the head. Okay, so one of the conditions of wudu is that after you finish washing the left arm, you don't acquire any new moisture. With that existing moisture, you have to wipe your head and feet. So taking moisture from the face, even though it's just the face, you know, scholars understand from the hadith that you should not do that. One should avoid doing that. Yes, they have mentioned that let's say you're about to wipe your head and for some reason your hand dried, right? Let's say your hand completely dried, there's no moisture in it. You can acquire some moisture from your face. That is an exception. But generally speaking, yes, you would have to avoid doing that. Right. I, let me check the ruling of the scholars to see what happens if someone unknowingly did that, right? Like they really thought this was okay. Many scholars will say the wudu is valid, but let me, let me check on that. Inshallah, I can follow up with you. Yeah, so make sure that after you wash the left arm, don't touch anything wet. Don't acquire any new moisture. With whatever moisture that exists on your hands, wipe the head and the feet. So you should be okay, inshallah, but I will double check the ruling of scholars to see, you know, the exception that they have made for that scenario. Any other questions? Yes, sister. Alaykum as -salam. Okay, how many times do you wash your arm? Now, Islamically, you have to offer one full washing of the face and the arms. And... Many scholars say it's mustahab to do a second full washing. What do we mean by a full washing? A full washing means that you pour water on your arms. It doesn't matter how many times you pour water. You can pour water once, twice, five times, ten times. But your niya, your intention is I'm still in the first washing. I just want to make sure that I'm washing my entire arm. So you can pour water several times just to make sure you got every place wet. And then once you're done with that, that's considered one full washing. You're allowed to do two full washings. If you do three full washings, that invalidates the wudu. But how many times you pour water in a washing, that's up to you. Pour as much water that you need to verify that you've covered all the arm. Does, does that answer the question? You, it doesn't have to be three times. It could be ten times. Let's say you put water, you're like, you know what, maybe I missed this place. Pour more water and keep wiping several times. You can do any number of, of, of wipings like that. 
But your niya is, I'm still in the first washing. That would be okay. So it's the full washing that counts. Now how you uh, arrive at the full washing, it's up to you. You could, some people with one pouring of water, they can do that. Some people know, you know, they need to make sure several times that the water got there. And then there are some people, it turns into a swas, make sure it doesn't get there. Where it's OCD with wudu. My grandfather, he says that maybe 80 years ago when, when he was in Karbala, he says one day there was a school for the students, seminary students. And you know that like those old schools, you had a nice courtyard in the middle and there was a small like fountain pool, right? Where people would do wudu from. He says there was an old man who had this severe waswas. May Allah protect us from that. There are people in our community who suffer from this waswas, unfortunately. Some youth who are so good, but they struggle with this. Now there are ways to break that. Now this old man had waswas. He says, I saw him one day. He was basically dipping his arm into the fountain to make sure that he's wetting it for wudu. He says, I saw him dipping it once, twice, three times. He just couldn't be certain that it got wet. He said, I counted that morning. He dipped it in the water 360 times. See what the shaitan does sometimes. Do you even have energy to do ibadah when you're in that type of waswas? <laughs> so when you're pouring the water, make sure it's not excessive. And don't waste too much water. You know, just be reasonable. Once, twice, three times, that should be reasonable. If you find yourself pouring water ten times, that's you're approaching OCD levels. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Any other questions? Yes, brother. What if you have a cast? If you have a cast, okay. So if you have a cast and your doctor has told you water cannot get into the cast, basically, if you can wipe on the cast, not pour water on it, on it just wipe with your wet hand, wipe on it. This is called wudu al jabira. You can do that. Let's say the cast also has to be free from moisture. Get a piece of cloth, put it on the cast. And then with your wet hand, the other hand, wipe on the cloth. That would be your wudu. And that's an acceptable wudu and you can pray like that. This is called wudu al jabira. Or let's say it's not a cast, there's a wound. There's an active wound and you have a bandage on it. The same thing applies. Put a pure piece of cloth on the bandage and then wipe on that piece of cloth. Just that part. The other parts of the arm, you, you have to wash. So that's how it would work with a cast. Yes, sister. Okay, that's a very good question. You did your wudu now. And your face is, you know, it's wet, your hands are wet. Can you dry yourself using a towel or some paper tissues to dry yourself? You are allowed. It does not invalidate the wudu, but it's makruh. It's not recommended. Why? Because these drops of wudu are nur, light, spiritual light from Allah. It's makruh to dry it. Let it dry on its own. So you can do that, but... I recommend you develop the habit where you don't. Let it dry. And when you let it dry, it has a better effect. Try it. Believe me. It has a better effect. When you pray, you just are more spiritual in that prayer. You feel the presence of wudu more. And subhanAllah, there's something, uh, you know, at least for me, I experienced this. Many men have also told this, uh, said this to me. When we normally wash our face, like for men who have a beard, when you, when you wash your face, you feel like the moisture lingers for a while. You feel it and it bothers you a little bit. You just want to dry it, but not for wudu. Try it. When you do the wudu, you just don't feel the moisture bothering you, subhanAllah. I personally can attest to that. And brothers have told me they can attest to that. Maybe you've not noticed that, but try it. I'm not saying this would apply to every person, but <laughs> there's... There's a lot of good experience behind that. So it's makruh to dry it. Try not to dry it. Any other final questions? Yes, brother. Alaykum as salam. Sometimes the water runs out of the cast and they have to wash it and then they have to do it in that manner to clear the air. Sometimes the water is a little bit foggy, right? That's still considered plain water Islamically. 
Because it's not really mixed with any other element that makes it a mudaf mixed water. Mixed water is like, for instance, a juice, right? That has water, but it's a mixed type of water. So even if the water is foggy, that's okay. You can do wudu with it. it is, it's still plain water. Or sometimes the water gets bubbly, right? Where it's not clear anymore. You can still wudu, do wudu with that. That's completely okay. Yes, brother. Okay, other schools of thought, they maintain that you have to wash your feet. Now, when we do our historical research about the wudu of the Prophet ﷺ and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, it's very clear that they would wipe their feet. They would not wash their feet. There's not a single sahih, authentic tradition that says the Prophet would wash his feet. And our argument comes from the Holy Quran, which is verse 6 of Surah Al Ma'idah that I uh, recited for you in the beginning. I will say to you the verse, and you tell me what is your understanding from the verse. So Allah says, O oh you who believe, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, idha qumtum ila salah, when you're about to pray, faghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum. Wash your face and hands to the elbow. So now you have a command. What's the command? Wash. And what are the two direct objects? Face, hands. فَغْسِلُوا This is a command, it's a verb, it's a command, imperative. What's the first object? وُجُوهَكُمْ Your face. The second, أَيْدِيَكُمْ Your hands. إِلَى المرافق. Then there's a new verb in Arabic. There's a new command. وَمْسَحُوا And wipe. بِرُؤُسِكُمْ which means part of your head. You don't wipe your full head, just a part of your upper head. And then, وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ And your feet. If I'm just speaking in plain, simple English, and I say, wash your face and hands to the elbow, and wipe your head and feet. What do you understand from feet? Wash it or wipe it? Wipe it. That's the closest verb to it. Imsahu. Allah is saying in the Holy Quran, wipe it. But other schools of thought, they have different interpretations, unfortunately. You know, due to their understanding of fiqh. And after the Prophet you know, there was a period of a century where the hadith was even banned from being recorded. The rulers banned it from being recorded. So there was a lot of confusion and many changes happened. But the Imams of Ahlul Bayt always took us back to the path of the Prophet Recently, I was watching an interesting interview by this scholar. I think he was in Morocco or Tunis. I think Morocco. And he was on, on Moroccan TV. And he had embraced the path of Ahlul Bayt. He came from a different school of thought and he had become Shia. He had followed the path of Ahlul Bayt. So the interviewer told him, what led you to become Shia? He told him the verse of wudu. He's like, how? He's like, one day I was in the masjid doing wudu. This young boy was standing next to me and he was doing his wudu. And he looked at me. I was washing my feet. He told me, uncle, why do you violate the Quran? He's like, I was shocked. I'm a scholar. And this little boy, I'm like, what do you know about the Quran? He's like, Allah says in the Holy Quran, wipe your feet. Why are you washing it? He's like, he read the verse to me. He's like, look, that's the closest verb. He's like, in that moment, this little boy just shook my entire existence. He's like, it just never crossed to my mind. He says, after that, I went on a long journey of research until finally I found the path of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musa. It's like, that small incident led me to the path of Ahlul Bayt Ali Musa. It's an interesting interview. If you know Arabic, watch it online. It's very fascinating. So Allah is very clear in the Holy Quran. Now, Here's a linguistic question for those who are interested in the linguistic grammatical aspect. In Arabic, when you have a verb like imsahu and it has a direct object, the direct object is mansub. It has the fatha, right? So Allah says, اِغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Not وُجُوهُكُمْ or hikum, hakum. There's a fatha, it's mansub because it's a direct object. Now, when Allah says, imsahu biru'usikum, it's majroor. It's not mansub. There's a kasra on it. Not a fatha. 
Allah doesn't say biru'u sekum. He says biru'u sikum. Why? Because you have a preposition here. The ba in Arabic is a preposition. Part of, with. That's a preposition. In Arabic, whenever you have a preposition, the word after it becomes majroor. Right? For instance, I'll give you an example. If you want to say, I saw the house in Arabic, what do you say? Ra'aytul, what would you say? Bayta, because it's mansub. If you use a preposition, you say, my brother is in the house. Akhi fil bayti. It becomes maksur. Why? Because of the preposition. Over here, because Allah says wipe with a part of your head, with the ba, the ru'us becomes what? Maksur. But the next word after that, arjulakum, it's maftuh, according to the common recitation of the Quran. There's a fatha in it. Because it's just the second object of the verb. Allah saying wipe part of your head and your feet to the ankles. So that is the closest command to the feet, which is very clear for us, that we wipe our feet. My dear brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I will keep you all in my prayers. Keep us in your prayers as well and stay safe. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.